Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to be with you. Good to see all of you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us. So on the east side of town, there is a concert venue called Shank Hall. Has anybody ever been to Shank Hall before? Yeah, it's kind of this hole-in-the-wall sort of place. It was opened up in the late 80s, and when you walk in, it kind of feels like nothing in that building has changed since the 80s. It's a really small venue. It, it holds maybe 200 people, and you walk in, it's just one big open room. There's a bar in the back, there's a stage in the front, and just a few cafe tables in between. And it's kind of one of those places that you just wonder, like, what is behind the walls of this place? Like, like what really has been spilled on the carpet of this place? Because you walk in, and it feels like the carpet hasn't been changed in the, the 30 years it's been open. And what has been spilled and not cleaned up here? It has this like gross uh, drop ceiling with all these tiles. And it kind of feels like if you were to peel back the tiles, you'd probably find like layers of smoke all in there. It's just kind of like a uh, sort of place. So it's early November uh, 2021. And Becky and I are walking into Shank Hall for a concert. The band that's playing is a band called The Lone Bella, one of my favorite bands. And I remember thinking as we walked in, like, are we really doing this? Like, is this really happening? Is this where we're going to see this band? And, and part of that was I, I couldn't really figure out, like, why this band was playing in this venue. We had seen them before, and they're a band that usually plays really nice theaters. Like, so they played the night before in Madison at the Majestic Theater. They were playing the evening after that in Chicago at another nice theater. And they usually play these venues that seat 750, 1,000 people. And this place is super tiny. I mean, it's smaller than this room. And I'm like, why in the world are they playing here? And so we walk in. And as we walk in, the, the opening band is in the middle of their act, and there's maybe 75 people in the room, and the opening act was just kind of, eh. and I remember thinking, like, is this show going to be any good? Like, in this dingy place, is the sound going to be any good? There aren't that many people here. Is it really going to be that great of a show? And I was just hesitant and, at the same time, a little confused. And so the opening band finishes. They flip the stage for the band that we were coming to see. They come out, and from the very first note of the show, everything was spot on. I mean, it was an amazing show. Their vocals were tight. Their harmonies were on point. The music was just out of this world, and it was as though they played as though they were playing to thousands of people. They had their heart and soul and in everything into it. And because it was such a small venue, like, and there was only maybe a hundred people there, we were like right at the front of the stage. We were like right there. It's like we could have a conversation with them in between songs if we wanted. We could reach out and touch them if we wanted. It was just an amazing night. And halfway through the show, I remember thinking to myself, I need more of this in my life. Now, the, the this wasn't I need more concerts, but I need more of this because what I was experiencing in that moment was awe and wonder at what I was seeing and hearing. There was this overwhelming sense of gratitude welling up in my heart because this is probably the first concert we had been to since the pandemic. It was our first night out that felt normal in about a year and a half. I'm sharing it with my favorite person, and just everything was spot on. There was all of this joy that was just bubbling up in my heart. And when I say I needed more of this, I'm saying I need more joy. Like what I'm experiencing right now, like I need more of that in my life. And I wonder this morning if anybody is here who would say the same thing. I Meaning like, I, I need and I want more joy in my life. Anybody? Yeah, I, I've never met anybody who would say no to that question. Like, I would, I've never met anybody who's like, no, I'm good on joy. I have enough. I'm okay. I could actually use a little less joy in my life, right? I've never met anybody who would say they want less joy. It's like, oh, how do I get more of that. Because in that moment, there was just all of these great things that I was experiencing. Now, as followers of Jesus, we kind of have to ask a question around this idea of receiving 
more joy? Like, is it okay to intentionally increase the joy in my life? Like, is that okay for us to do? Because the common concept of our faith is that we are called to deny ourselves, right? Jesus said that, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. The call is to humble ourselves. The call is to prioritize others over ourselves and lower ourselves. The mindset that we are called to have is to put others first and to serve them. So if we are intentionally trying to increase the joy in our lives, is that antithetical to our faith? Is it self-serving and selfish and an over-prioritization of self? Because I think many people assume that about our faith. I think many people assume that the God of our faith is this old curmudgeon in the sky who just wants people to be unhappy, and the Bible is a book of rules that's intended to diminish and limit and restrict our joy. I think many people view our faith in that regard. But I would say the exact opposite is true. I would say that that God desires our joy to increase. He desires that our joy would overflow that it would abound, that it would affect other people. And as we're going to see in our passage today, God's desire is that our joy would be made complete. His desire is that our joy would actually increase, not decrease. And so the question then is, well, how? Like, how does that happen? Like, if God's hope and His design for the way that we're supposed to live is that our joy would increase and overflow, how do we get that? How do we experience that? And we have to ask another question. Are there things in our life, are there things that we're doing and that we're engaging in that are actually hindering our joy? Are there obstacles that are self-made that are hindering the joy that we can experience? Well, our passage today answers both of those questions. It highlights three things that might be hindering joy in our life, and it points us also to the ultimate source of ever-increasing joy. And this is how our passage begins. This is John 3, starting in verse 22. It says, after this, which is a reference to what happened before, after Jesus had a conversation with Nicodemus, it says, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. So as Jesus moves in, or as John moves into the second half of chapter 3, there's a scene change. Jesus, in the passage before, is in a candlelit house somewhere in Jerusalem, and now he's on the countryside out by a river. John the Baptist is also there with his disciples, and Jesus and John are both baptizing people who are coming. You could say it's kind of like a riverside revival that's going on in this moment. And as they are baptizing people, we're told this is what starts to surface in verse 25. It says, an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. So, the first thing that has the potential to hinder our joy is arguments and whether or not we get embroiled in arguing with people. Now, what's really interesting about this verse is that it raises more questions than it answers. Like the first question being, who is this certain Jew? We're not told anything about this person, where they're from, or or what they're all about. And usually what you find is that when unnamed, unidentified people are inserted into John's stories, they're oftentimes religious leaders, Pharisees, Uh, priests and Levites, especially when it's surrounding some sort of argument. You you see it all the time throughout his gospel. You'll see it by the time we hit chapter 5. A group of Pharisees is arguing with Jesus about something. It's going to happen again in chapter 8. It's going to happen again in chapter 9. It's going to happen again in chapter 10. Pharisees and religious leaders are often coming to Jesus arguing with him about different religious matters. Now, the other thing that raises here 
is not just who this certain Jew is. We're not even told if it's a religious leader. The other thing, the other question that's raised is what are they actually arguing about? Now, it, it says here that they're arguing about ceremonial washing, which is part of the Old Testament law. But ceremonial washing includes a wide variety of things. Because in the Old Testament, there's all these scenarios and all these rules and regulations about how you're supposed to stay pure and clean yourself when you come in contact with different things. Like if you uh, come in contact with somebody who has a skin disease, you're supposed to purify yourself in a certain way. If you come across bodily fluids, you're supposed to purify yourself in a certain way. Same if you encounter a dead person. And then there's all of these rules and regulations for how priests were supposed to prepare themselves and wash themselves before they enter the temple. So ceremonial washing is a really vast topic, and they could be arguing about all sorts of different things. Now, I wonder whether this person is a religious leader or a Pharisee or not, what I wonder is if they're arguing about the appropriateness of baptism. Because that's what's happening in the context of this story. John the Baptist is baptizing people. Jesus is baptizing people. And all of their disciples are also baptizing people. Now, baptism was something that happened in the first century world. But in a Jewish context, it was reserved for those who were Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism. If you were a non-Jew and you wanted to become Jewish, you had to do a variety of things to become Jewish, and baptism was one of them. But notice who's being baptized here. It's not Gentiles wanting to convert. It's Jews who are coming from their own country, engaging with both John and Jesus, which means they're making a huge statement, a huge statement that something is broken or wrong with the religious system of Jesus' day. And there's a good chance whoever this certain Jew is, is coming and basically picking a fight and arguing with some of John, of John the Baptist's disciples. And so one of the things that has the potential to hinder our joy is getting engaged in petty arguments with people. Now, one of the arguments um, that has been happening in our home as of late surrounds toilet paper. Uh, we have in our house, when somebody finishes a roll of toilet paper, we have strategically placed spots in both bathrooms where there is always extra rolls of toilet paper that you can pull from. The expectation is when somebody finishes a roll of toilet paper, they should swap out the new roll for the empty roll, but instead somebody takes a new roll, they use it, and then they put it on top of the old roll that's empty like this, right? Does that happen in anybody else's household? Yeah. And nobody was willing to admit that in first service. I had one guy who raised his hand. Everybody was just like, no, 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 we, we do not. That does not happen. Now, the thing that has been the argument around this is, uh, God bless my wife, but Becky has been declaring that she is the only one who actually swaps out the empty roll with a new roll. Like, repeatedly and regularly, she's like, why? Why in this house? Does nobody else take the three seconds that it takes to swap out the rolls? And, amen. <laughs> now, I actually agree with her in this. So the argument isn't that that's happening. The argument is she's declaring she's the only one doing it. And by making that declaration, she's making an accusation against me. Like, I don't do it. Like, I'm with her. We're on the same team. We have these three rugrats who mess up our house all the time. They're the ones who are doing it. We have people over. It just happened this Friday night. They're leaving the house. Something's mentioned about the bathroom. And she takes it upon herself to make this declaration again. I'm the only one. Thank you for letting me air that. All right? Now, that is a, a, a petty argument, right? And I'm sure you guys have petty arguments in your house as well. And it can be lighthearted. And hopefully we can get to the point where we laugh at it. But some of us here are addicted 
to arguing. We love to argue. You, you probably know people. Anytime there is a controversial topic that surfaces, whoom, they swoop in. Anytime there is a hot topic to discuss, whoom, they swoop in and they insert themselves in the conversation because we have this insatiable desire to be right. The reason we engage in arguing is because we always want to be right. Now, you might think, well, winning actually increases joy in my life. Like, I love to win an argument, and I feel so good when I do, right? Anybody willing to admit that? Because what's happening in your brain when you win an argument is that uh, the Harvard Business Review actually did a study on this, that dopamine is released in your brain, which is the pleasure chemical, and actually gives you that good feeling when you win an argument. It's the same brain chemical that is released when an addict gets a fix. And so they're making the case in this article that you literally, from brain chemistry, can be addicted to arguing in the same way an addict is addicted to a substance. It's, it's the same chemical that also when you're scrolling through social media and you notice you have all of these responses and likes to some sort of post and all sorts of engagements there, you're like, ah, that feels really good. So you could say, well, yeah, winning an argument feels really good because the same thing is happening in your brain that happens to an addict when they get a fix or an alcoholic when they take a drink or any other drug of choice that we use to feel good. And while an addict might feel pleasure, feeling pleasure is way different than experiencing joy. Those two things are very different. Because in the Bible, joy is about having this deep satisfaction, this deep sense of gratitude and contentment that isn't wrapped up in my circumstances or my situation. That's why in the scriptures we read, even in our suffering and even in our hardship, we rejoice. Not because of our suffering, not because of our hardship, but even in the midst of the most difficult seasons of life, we can experience joy because joy isn't rooted in pleasure and it's not rooted in circumstances. It's rooted in relationship, specifically relationship with God. And what happens when we're constantly engaging in arguments, when we're addicted to arguing because we always have to be right and we always have to win, we actually disconnect ourselves from relationship. And so we don't experience joy because joy is found in relationship, again, namely with God, but we're cutting those off. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, yeah, am I addicted to arguing, always winning, and always being right? And when arguing becomes a habitual practice in your life, the other thing that starts to happen is you start to grow suspicious. You start to grow suspicious of other people, and that's exactly what's happening in this story. We're not told the substance of the argument that John the Baptist's disciples are having with this certain Jew. We're not told how it ends, but as soon as it's over, John the Baptist's disciples get suspicious about Jesus. Because remember, John the Baptist and Jesus and their disciples are at the same river baptizing, and we read this in verse 26. They, being John the Baptist's disciples, came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. Now, when you read right through from verse 25 right into verse 26 without stopping, the certain Jew with whom they're arguing exits the story as quickly and abruptly as he enters. Again, there's no mention of how the argument actually plays out. We don't know exactly how it ends, but as soon as it's over, John the Baptist's disciples immediately go to John and they say, hey, 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 what's going on with that guy, Jesus, over there? They get suspicious about him. And when we grow suspicious, there are usually two things that accompany our suspicion. And the first is comparison. We are quick to compare ourselves to others. And when we compare, we are looking at the lives of other people and what they have and the circumstances they're in, and then we measure our life against it. That's what's happening with the, the disciples from John the Baptist. They're measuring their own ministry against the ministry of Jesus. And we often evaluate 
other people's lives as though their lives are the standard for everybody, right? Anybody also willing to admit that they do this? Yeah. I mean, I do it all the time. I did it just this week. I was at a pastor's gathering out in Waukesha, at a church in Waukesha on Wednesday of this week. And I walk into this gathering, and I've been to this church before. It'd been a couple years. It's probably before the pandemic. I walk in, and I walk into their lobby, and I just notice that it, it looks new. It kind of still has that new lobby smell to it. Everything just looks bright and put together, and instantly I start to notice all the details of what they have done in their lobby, and immediately I'm starting to second-guess all the decisions that we've made about our own lobby. Like, oh, what about look at what they're doing with their cafe here? Should we do that? Oh, look at this thing over here. And then they have these easels set up with new pretty pictures, like of another campus that they're going to be launching later this year, and I start to think to myself, like, they're ahead of us. Like they're doing all these great things. They have their lobby built already and it's done and ours is a hot mess and they're doing all these other things out in the community. And instantly I found myself comparing their ministry to ours as though their ministry and where they're at is a standard. And I start to compare rather than celebrate the progress of what's happening here because there are amazing things happening here. Just the work that's been going on here alone and the volunteers who are doing it, it's just been mind-blowing and amazing. But yet somehow I lose sight of that and I start to compare their stuff with ours. And Theodore Roosevelt is quoted by saying, comparison is the thief of joy. When you compare because of your suspicion because you have this desire to be right and win, it decreases the joy in your life. Instead of celebrating our progress in that moment, I got bent out of shape trying to like catch up with theirs. And usually the other thing that comes along with comparison when we find ourselves in a place of suspicion is insecurity. The reason we compare is because We're insecure. And what's happening in this passage with John the Baptist's disciples and what they're noticing about all these people going to Jesus instead of them is a a reality that happens for pastors all the time. Because throughout the course of your ministry, there are people who are going to be a part of your church and they're going to leave to go to another church. Just this past week, we had somebody who came to us. They've been here for a couple years. They made a decision for a variety of reasons to go to another church. And when that happens and when you find out where they're going as pastors, the thing that you just instinctively do is you internet stalk that other church, right? You get online and you start to look at that church's website. You look at their social media. You look at all their programming and you think to yourself, are they bigger than us? Are they better than us? Are they more slick? Do they have it together? Not, not that I did that this week or anything <laughs> or anything, but that's what just some other pastors tend to do, right? Because you grow insecure because you think like, ah, I have to be keeping up with other people rather than just embracing like who you are and what God has entrusted to you. And usually, when you compare and you find insecurity bubbling up in your life, it's a symptom of the pursuit of greatness. Thinking like, I have to be great. I have to be on top. I have to be the best. And this theme of greatness is baked into our culture, like all over the place. We're always trying to be great and prove that we're greater and better than other people. Like, if you're going to go home, and watch the Super Bowl this afternoon, I guarantee you somewhere along the way in the pre-game broadcast, in the game itself, there will be comparisons of Patrick Mahomes to Tom Brady. Tom Brady is said to be the greatest of all time. He's the GOAT, right? Because he's won seven Super Bowls. But everybody's like, well, maybe Patrick Mahomes is going to surpass him. We always got to have somebody who's taking down the person on top because he's younger. He's already won two, two Super Bowls, and he could actually surpass Tom Brady. We're always arguing about who is the best. And that was true in Jesus' time because his own disciples regularly were arguing amongst them about which one of them was the greatest of the disciples. And sometimes even engaged Jesus, like, Jesus, tell him. Tell him, Jesus, I'm the one who's the best, right? Because it's something twisted about the human heart that we have to prove to other people 
that we are better. And what starts to then happen, the practice of that, is we regularly compete with other people, e even when they don't know that we are competing with them, right? We just constantly, naturally compete. Now, some of you guys know um, that one of the things that I've done over the years is um, I compete in a storytelling competition downtown uh, at Anodyne Coffee. It's called The Moth. It's a storytelling organization that puts on these events all over the country. And uh, you have a topic that you have to come. It's kind of like a um, open mic sort of structure where you put your name in a hat. And if they call your name, then you get to tell a story, a five-minute story on that topic. Uh, they, they judge you. And then you compete against other storytellers. So I'm going to invite my friend Beth. This is Beth Galvan. She goes to our church, um, and, and Beth and I have actually competed in storytelling competitions, uh, this one against each other. We have a picture. That, that's us front and center. This was taken uh, around this time last year, and the theme of that evening was Love Hurts. And so you showed up that night. Yes. And told a story. Mm -hmm. yes. And what was like the nature of the story that you told? Um, I told a story of how I um, gave birth to my daughter in the car on the way to the hospital. Um, actually, my husband delivered um, the baby. So if you see Joe, you can congratulate him. Yes. Very. <laughs> like when I, when I heard that story, I was like, what happened? Like how did, so she goes and tells that story that night. I told a story about my parents uh, caring for their elderly parents. Mm -hmm. And what happened what was the result of that evening? The result is that I won the competition for that day. You yes. won the competition, yes. yes. Now, how many times before that night had you been on stage to tell a story? Um, I was one other time. I told a story about um, uh, a time I smuggled my cat into a grocery store, and um, it turned off all the credit card machines. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Brian has told like eight stories before then. Right. right. And how many have I won? Zero. Zero. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is like, I'm trying to win. Like I tell people like I really am. Like I want to win one of these things. They have a podcast. I've been listening to them off for years. I'm like, I just want to win one. If I could just win one. Now, this is the second person who attends our church who has gone to one of these story slams and won. And I have yet to win. And like, I do this for a living. Like every week I stand in front of people. Every week I'm writing stories. Like I'm a professional public speaker, but I can't win. Now, one of the unique things about what they do is if you win one of these story slams, they have an end of the year in December grand slam, right? And so because you won the one in February of last year, you got to go and tell a story in the Grand Slam, which was in December. And what was the, the nature of the story that you told there? Um, I told a story of when I was a postal worker. I um, uh, just kind of did a best of, of all the times I hit something with my postal vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was back in December. And what was the result of that as well? Um, I won that one too. <laughs> <laughs> So that makes, uh, how many times have you told stories? I've told three stories. Three. And how many have you won? Two. Two, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And again, I have won zero. <laughs> zero. Now, what was really unique about being at that first one that you won, like you told me about the story that you were going to tell, and we had kind of engaged in it throughout the week. And I found myself watching you, listening to you. And when they called your name to win, it was this incredible feeling because I felt like I won too. It was this moment of yeah. like, ah, like there's a glimpse of winning because we had engaged sure. in the story. Well, and what happened actually is Brian helped me with the, um, with the story because we'd been um, talking, ab um, it was about child dedication. We were on the phone, you're like, hey, if you ever need help. And I was like, <laughs> I of course will accept help because I'm not a professional storyteller at all. And then, so he saw the transcript of what I had, was going to say. And he said, okay, take out the entire beginning. You have to start in the action to make it more exciting. Then you need to like, probably delete this part out because it just gets boring and then maybe like expand on this one part because it's totally clutch and you just kind of gloss over it. And I saw immediately that what he had done to my story was make it amazing instead of just like, you know, pretty okay. Um, so because I'm so insecure, I invited you to speak nice things about me so I could feel better about myself. <laughs> no, it's, 
<laughs> it's all true. It's all true. And he said, you don't have to take any of my suggestions. I'm like, I'm taking all of these suggestions. This is amazing. So. But it highlights when you engage with other people and you don't compete with them, but you partner with them, mm. like their success in some ways becomes your success. Yeah, it fully was. Yeah. Yes. Well, thanks uh-huh. for so much for being willing yeah, to, to do absolutely. this. Everybody give her a round of applause. <laughs> so for us, when we have this pursuit of greatness and we naturally compete with other people, John the Baptist tells us, well, well here's the right response. Here's how you're supposed to actually engage with what's happening. He says this in verse 27. To this he replied, a person can only receive what is given them from heaven. You yourself can testify that I said, I'm not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. So our opening question was, how do you intentionally increase joy in your life? The first is by knowing and accepting who you are. John says, like, you can only receive what is given to you. Jesus, for whatever reason, gives certain things to certain people and not to other people. And the first place of receiving or experiencing increased joy is receiving and owning and accepting who you are and in some ways who you're not. Meaning the call is to steward your life with what God has entrusted to you for the sake of bettering the lives of other people of increasing the joy in this world, of coming along and investing what has been given to you into other people. And as you do that, your joy will exponentially increase. And then he goes on to say this in verse 29. He said, the bride belongs to the bridegroom, and the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him. So he introduces this quick metaphor at the end of this passage to say that... When it comes to a wedding day, the the bridegroom is what we'd call the groom, right? There's an attendant here who's attending to the bridegroom, which we would probably call the best man. And the role of the best man is to serve, is to celebrate, and to highlight what's happening in the groom's life that day. And he goes on to say, when he listens for him and his joy, he is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. Meaning, when we know who we are and who we're not, and we have this posture of coming alongside other people, the second thing that we're called to do to increase our joy is to celebrate their success. On a wedding day, um, anybody who is trying to steal, you know, the spotlight from the bride or the bridegroom is thought to be kind of crazy because it's not your day, it's their day. And the way you enjoy the day is by celebrating what's going on in their life and lifting them up. And he says, in this scenario, he's making the parallel that Jesus is the bridegroom. And all of these people going to him are his bride, i.e. the church. And we find great joy when we understand who Jesus is and who we are in light of who he is and celebrate those who are coming to him. And he says, that joy is mine. The joy of celebrating the bridegroom has, who has come to receive his people, that joy is mine and it is now complete. So when we understand who we are and who we're not, and who Jesus is, and who we are in light of who Jesus is, and we celebrate those around us, and primarily celebrate what God has done in our lives through Jesus, it is the way that our joy exponentially grows. Because it's not rooted in our circumstances. Our circumstances might change, things might get really hard in life, but when we look at who Jesus is, And what he has done by bringing salvation to the whole world through his death on the cross, being buried in a tomb for three days, and coming to new life, ushering in new creation for everyone who believes in him, that should cause our heart to leap and our song to sing. And that's what we come to do week in and week out, is to celebrate the work that God has done through Jesus on our behalf. Because what John is trying to help his disciples see is that Jesus' greatness is our source of joy. His greatness in our life, the love that he has that Miss Jackie was talking about earlier, that's immeasurable. It's so big. It's so vast. It fills the universe, and we can't fathom how huge it is. And when we exalt him and understand what he has done for us, the natural result is that joy increases in our life. And so my hope for you this morning is that you would see that you don't have to be right, nor do you have to win. 
My hope is that you would resist the temptation to compare yourself to other people. That you would have the ability to celebrate their successes because you know who you are and who you are is deeply rooted in Jesus Christ and that it's his greatness that is our source of joy. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who Jesus is and what he has done and how he is and will continue to transform our lives and transform this world. And in the here and now, there are days when it feels like things are not going well. Many of us this morning might be sitting in circumstances that are less than ideal. Many of us this week might be finding the temptation to compare all over the place. We might find that insecurity bubbles up, that we're suspicious that there's something about arguing that just makes me feel really good. So Lord, I pray in these places, we would be able to see that it's in you, in your glory, in your greatness, that we are made complete. We pray this in your name. Amen.